Hello. You guys, I'm so nervous. Um, I'm very excited to be with y'all, but if you haven't noticed, I got so excited I left my house without my iPad or my Bible. Um, so we're going to wing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to dive in. Uh, it's a message written on my heart. So if God's word's written on your heart, there's going to come a day, there's a potential that we can't even have the freedom to hold the Bible in our hand. Will his truth be scribed on your heart? Um, but yes, before we jump in, before we dive in, like you said, um, I am married, smoking hot husband, Jeremiah, six foot five, I'm six foot one, and we do have two daughters, um, but I need to preface, it's more along the lines of avatars. Both of my children were born, they were 10.1 pounds. Um, Y'all, I saw the light, I almost went home <laughs> to Jesus, it was a lot. They came out like like, I mean, toddlers that I, <laughs> my two-year-old is now three and a half feet tall, and my 11-month-old is just big. It's just a lot. Um, so we roam around Atlanta like a family of avatars, and we get to travel the country doing ministry and, and internationally sometimes as well. Um, and travel comes with, like, ups and downs and highs and lows and always an adventure. So I need to know if Grace Clark is in here or if she's, well, I won't know if you're tuned in, but is Grace Clark present? Grace, <laughs> y'all listen to this. My friend Brittany and I are driving here today. <laughs> it's just a travel story. And we're brainstorming about my third book to come up and what God's been unpacking in our hearts and the Holy Spirit is filling the car. Things are on fire and we're just so fired up and stirred up and she's taking notes and I'm just in the spirit, couldn't even see straight. And all of a sudden I can see police lights in the back behind me and I was like, well, Lord, <laughs> you gotta come through because I'm going 67 and a 45, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, but the officer walked up to the car and he was like, license and proof of insurance. So I was like, okay. <laughs> Gave it to him. <laughs> also praying in tongues behind my throat, like, Lord, I need to see the body of Christ unite in this moment if he is a believer. And so he said, do you realize how fast you're going? And I was like, oh, it's just that I'm headed to Lee University to speak at chapel. And he goes, his whole disposition changed and he was like, my daughter goes to Lee. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. Well, it just, is she gonna be at chapel? And so this is when I started praying like, Lord, this is how I need to see the body of Christ unified, <laughs> unify the church, that we would be of peace in one accord. And so he was like, I need to run this. And so he goes back to his car and we're just hopeful. And he came back and he gave me my license and that was it. And I was like, <laughs> thank you what's your daughter's name? And he was like, it's Grace. And I was like, and you live that. Thank you for this <laughs> grace and mercy. Thank you. So Grace, your father is a heaven sent. He's wonderful. If you see Grace, tell your dad he said thank you. <laughs> Officer Clark. Uh, but I will get serious. I do want to dive in. Um, I also want to say hey to the class of faith and sexuality that's moving through the book right now. Very cool. Uh, one girl waved it like, sign this after, sign it. So I love it. I love that you guys are moving through that book. And that's kind of the content that I want to dive into today and share with you guys um, just this call that we have to build our lives and build our lives in purity. And what does that look like? And that makes a lot of us uncomfortable, and it's certainly not something that my testimony like echoed with at all through the vast majority of my life, particularly in college, but God is a great redeemer who can intersect and transform our hearts and continue to call us to holiness, to purity, continue to compel us to walk in faithfulness in response to his goodness and his grace and his glory. So I want to dive into some hard stuff, some messy stuff. Everybody just shake out a little bit, be like, Carol, we are talking about sex, and this is awkward, but just get ready. It's going to be good, I promise. Uh, but we'll start. I'm really, I'm like fired up. You guys are fun already. No one laughs at me this much. This is amazing. <laughs> um, so I want to open us in prayer and then, and then we'll jump in. God, we see you, Lord. Um, we love you. Thank you for loving us first, for seeing us, for knowing us, for knowing every hair 
on our head for knowing the plans and purpose you have for us. God, thank you for how good you are, for how kind you are, for how steadfast and unchanging you are, for how powerful you are, for how full of authority you are. You, God, are holy. You are seated above. You are in control. We speak this to just declare it today. You are the God of the universe. Yet still you know our name. Thank you, God, for loving us. I ask right now in this place, your Holy Spirit would just enter in and would just rain down. I declare in Jesus' name that any spirit of fear, any spirit of shame, any spirit of doubt, any spirit of guilt, anything unclean in this place that has taken root or has any authority right now in the name of Jesus, we claim authority over this time. We claim this as holy ground. We invite the Holy Spirit to move in power, to move us out of the way. We bind up anything in here that would inhibit that. Any weapon formed against us cannot stand. It cannot prosper. Any flaming arrow of the evil one we, we pray, God, you would put a hedge of protection and deflect and block. God, in Jesus' name, you will be glorified. So we take authority over anything in here that would distract or deter from that. We bind it up by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cancel its assignment, and we send it back to the pit where it came from, Lord. You give us that power and that authority in Jesus' name. Thank you for equipping us, Lord. Would you meet us? Would you teach us? Would you minister to us in this time? Would a spirit of purity move through this place? And would your love just meet us as each heart in here needs it? God, I ask that you move me out of the way that you take over my tongue, that these be your words, not my own. You know every heart, every soul, every story in this room, and I do not, God. So I pray right now that the words would leave my lips and that you would tailor them specifically to each and every need, every detail, every layer of different people's stories in this room, that it would be translated when it reaches their ear to impact and minister to their heart and their story and their sin right now, that we would see deliverance, that we would see revival in Jesus' name. We ask it all. We thank you, God. We love you. Amen. So when it comes to sex, we need to talk. We need to talk about sex. It's what compelled me to write the second book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot, because right now I look out at the world and I see sex as the greatest thematic conversation, issue, topic that's really permeating our culture Yet I also see a culture that's incredibly wounded, in great pain, hashtag me too, going viral because sex is permeating the culture, but it's been twisted and it's been cheapened and it's been perverted and it's been worshipped and it's been idolized. And yes, it's a great weapon against the enemy that God's given us, but with wielded without knowledge, without wisdom, without understanding. It's a weapon that wounds. And so I look out and I see a hurting world and many ways I feel like the church, the body of Christ has kind of been bullied out of the conversation a little bit. We've kind of been stuffed into a corner and granted we've kind of done things wrong a little bit over time. We've felt the bullying out. We haven't felt great authority. We haven't really known how to talk about it. So we've just kind of spouted the do this, don't do that. This is right. This is wrong. Follow these rules. This is sin. This is not. And, and really we haven't done the body of Christ a great service or even the world a great service because we're hurting. We're wounded and people are giving a glance at the church with the questions that they have right now because there's no real resolution or healing coming. And so I find that they're giving a glance at the church to help us. What hope do you have? What truth do you have? Is there some answer to the anguish in my soul? And we look at the church and right now the church is silent. We are silent as the body of Christ. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to say it. 
Sexual conversation seems big and messy and overwhelming. We don't know exactly how to tackle it. Or what I find most frequently is that we are silent because the enemy has silenced us with shame because it's sin that we're wrestling with too. And so I looked at the word of God and what I actually began to see and understand was that God was the inventor of sex. God created sex. God has a lot to say about sex. This is where I would have my Bible here and I would do this amazing hand motion. We're just gonna go with it. God has a lot to say through his holy word about sex. God created it as a gift. He gave instruction around it, design. It was created as an act of worship, a unifying gift, and actually a weapon against the enemy. If we ever thought about sex in this way, this is how it was formed and how it was fashioned. In fact, the first conversation God ever had with man was about sex, and so it confuses me when we look to the church about what we have to say about sex, and we don't want to talk about it, or it feels taboo, or that's nothing that we discuss here. Just don't do it, and just wait until you're at the altar, and maybe a switch will flip, and suddenly you'll be able to embrace it fully, and we look at it, and and what I'm confused by is to talk about sex is to look more like the one who created it. Because God talks about sex. In fact, the word is riddled with narratives of sexual struggle. We see kingdoms rise and fall around sexual issues. We see Jesus encounter the sexually broken. We see guidance. We see instruction. But we don't really know or understand much about it. And we must. We must so that we can be healed and whole. We can reach a generation that is hurting and needs answers and needs hope and needs Jesus. So we need to talk about sex. My testimony is one of great brokenness in this area and one of unfathomable redemption in this area. So I truthfully don't stand up here as a preacher. I stand up here as a pilgrim because I learned every hard lesson, every hard way. And my only hope for healing, for deliverance, from, for understanding around these things was to look at the steadfast, never-changing Word of God. And what I began to see when I began to study the Word around sex was that, like I said, the very first conversation God ever had with man had to do with sex. It's one of the first things he spoke to us. And someone's like, well, Deborah, I didn't see that. And where do I go back to? Genesis, it's the first conversation. He has with us, God made Adam and Eve, and he said, now, be fruitful, be constructive, be productive, rule over what I've made. You are the pinnacle of my creation, made in my image, an image-bearing creation of God with every bit of identity, every bit of worth, every bit of value knit into your DNA. You are not just here, you are his. He created you created man, created woman, different, unique, as partners, as teammates. He said, now go forth, be fruitful, rule over what I've made, be constructive, be productive, don't be distracted, depend on me, hear my voice, walk with me, talk with me, navigate life in a fruitful manner and multiply. God's talking about sex right off the bat. In Genesis, he's literally saying in this covenantal marriage that I've made between the two of you in my instruction, in my design, multiply, fill the earth. And so what we see when we look at this are two things married together from the very, some of the very first words that came out of God's mouth to man. We see our inherent identity is image-bearing creations of God. And we see our sexual instruction given to us by God. But what happens here is these things were married, they were unified, they were always intended to move in power and purpose together, but what we see in the garden and what we often see in our lives is that sin entered in. And how did sin enter in in the garden? Eve didn't wake up one day and she was like, well, you know what? About to go buck wild, screw the obedience. Like, she didn't just wake up and flip a switch of like, it's time to go crazy. Eve was tempted by the enemy 
who convinced her there could be more. There could be better. God's probably withholding something from you. He's given you this instruction, but he said you can't have that. And so this is good. This is desirable. Don't you just want to try it? And in our lives, few of us wake up and we're like, well, sometimes freshmen in college, just discount that group. But not many of us. <laughs> Part of my story. It's rough. Not many of us wake up, though, and we're like, I am a chaste virgin, and I'm about to sleep with 18 people right now. Like, we don't wake up and just thrust into a decision of sin and depravity. Oh. Some freshmen here are like, oh my gosh. How did she know? Oh. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, faculty and staff. We're just getting very honest. No, but the truth is many of us become tempted by the small thing, the little thing, the enemy telling us, yeah, God's way is fine and good. You're in the Bible belt. You're Christian, you're good. Choose to choose for yourself what you want and what's best for you. Don't you want to choose for yourself? And I'm like, well, yeah, this kind of piques my curiosity. And maybe if I just tried that, and I know that this person and this person have done that, and I know that this is what sort of media portrays to me, what the movies play out. This is something I desire. It seems great. It seems wonderful. And so it's the tiny little step in, and then the tiny little step in, and the tiny little step in. And what happens is suddenly we wake up one day and we realize we're a mile deep because we've been choosing to choose for ourselves and the enemy gets a stranglehold around us and jerks us away. What happens is our inherent identity, image-bearing creations of God, married with obedience and beautiful sexual instruction. When sin enters in, sexual sin in particular, it rips these two things apart. And what does sexual sin become in our lives? It becomes the very thing that we use to try to find our worth, find our value, find our identity. I want to feel loved. Loved. I want to feel beautiful. I want to feel powerful. I want to feel masculine. I want to feel seen. I want to feel known. Maybe if I give them a piece of my body, they'll give me their heart. And sexual sin becomes the thing that we wound and wield like a weapon because we don't realize that we're trying to get back to find, to be made whole in what was always married from the start before sin caused divide. This is the why at the root. This is not just a preacher standing at the podium, shaking our frustrated fists at the world about the failing morality of our culture. We don't need to know any, any more about the failing morality of our culture. We can look on social media and see that. What we need and what the world needs to know is why it matters to listen to God, to obey God, to move in purity, to understand these things. We don't need band-aids on bullet holes. We need to know the aching, bleeding needs of our heart. And so many of us are aching and bleeding and in the throes of sexual sin because we haven't understood the why, why God calls us to be pure, to pure lives is so he can move through a pure and willing and obedient vessel in power so that he can operate through you to help set the captives free so that you and him can commune, can know relationship, monogamous relationship, not torn apart by an adulterous heart. The why at the root God has always called us to purity, to obedience to his command is so we can know our identity, know whose we are, so that he can move through us in power. But that's just not many of our stories. It's not the narrative the world is pumping down our throat. My story started um, knowing a lot about God. I was raised up in the church, which wonderful, praise Jesus. But what I heard a lot was the narrative of do this, don't do that, this is wrong, this is not, rather than the roots of the why. And I also had sat down, this is a, just a funny side story, I don't want to lose my train of thought, but I just love sharing it. Um, I, I, maybe I shouldn't, I'm a little pressed for time. You know, we're just going to go there. Point is, okay, in the second grade when I was nine years old, I had to do a project about snakes, and I could not figure out for the life of me how snakes had sex. No one knows! Try to Google it. It's... <laughs> 
It's a great mystery. So I came down to my mom's room to ask her about this. And at that point, at nine years old, I had already had a neighbor, an older girl, take me out to the woods, a fort that we had built, and tell me everything there was to know about sex. I wasn't asking. It was startling at best. But I had already been downloaded with all of these broken and perverse things. And at nine years old, I'd already been exposed to pornography. A novelty poker card had fallen out of the back of my dad's truck, my father's truck, and I'd picked up. And many of us know that first exposure to porn sears something on our heart. I immediately knew it wasn't good. I couldn't make sense of why my daddy was looking at this when my mommy was in that house. I knew it was filthy. I immediately felt guilt. I felt shame. I shouldn't have seen that. That was wrong. That was off. But here's also a part of our narrative is that our our, our shame, our guilt, then kind of turns to curiosity because we've been exposed to this thing and it made us feel some kind of way and nine years old, porn started calling out to me. I started seeking it out where I could. At that time, it was like these channels on TV that were blurry that you had to just really use your imagination. (laughs) Finding it in my friend's parents' closet, seeking out what more of a stash my dad may have. Years and years and years passed where porn had a stranglehold over me. And some people are sitting in here like, but she's female. Yeah. We're sexual beings, male and female alike. It's knit into us by God. Sex is a gift God's given us. He's made us as sexual beings. So if you think for one second, it's just going to be so easy to just not think about it, resist, not face sexual temptation until we stand at the altar and in God's design, sex kind of comes onto the table. We're kidding ourselves. We're inundated with pressure, with exposure, with overwhelming perversion. It streams into our eyes and our ears, and many of us aren't even caring about what we're looking at and listening to, and then we're wondering why we're struggling in sexual sin. But we're like, but Cardi B's kind of banging. And it's like, wait, what? No, in 2016 alone, one calendar year on one pornographic website, We as a people consumed one, let me just preface, one pornographic website. There are hundreds of thousands. Find porn if you hit a wrong hashtag on Twitter. One site, one year, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of pornography. That is 524,000 years, or 17,000 complete lifetimes of porn consumed in one year on one website. We are inundated, overwhelmed, wrestling, males and females alike, battling with an enemy who doesn't even have to work hard to steal the purity of our eyes, our minds, our ears. Porn, sexual perversion, promiscuity, it's affecting men, it's affecting women. The average age of exposure to porn is nine years old. It's affecting children. So I was exposed to these things and asked my mom this question about snakes to rewind back, because I know y'all are looking for this answer. Asked her about how this happened, and I'm sure I don't have the answer. Uh, I'm sure started using terms and words and things that probably terrified a mother's heart. So what she told me simply to try to summarize was she said, you know, God desires that we be virgins until we're married. Your father and I were both virgins when we married. And I interrupted her and triumphantly stood up at nine years old and said, then mother, I too will be a virgin until I'm married. And I marched out of the room. I've been theatrical since childhood. And I'm sure for her that felt like a small win, like, okay, I'll take it. And that proclamation, being a churched kid, knowing a lot about what the church said, that proclamation felt amazing, but ultimately it was a works-based answer to a life-surrender question. You see, God in his word talks far more about purity than he does about virginity. You see, virginity is a beautiful byproduct should be a beautiful move of obedience, should be what flows from our life, but God talks far more about purity than he does virginity, and many of us churched kids have walked through life waving this vain 
virgin banner like I did, and yet struggling with sexual sin in other ways. And many times our questions become, okay, how far is too far? Rather than how close, God, can I draw near to you? And so I started navigating through with this vain virginity vow, and that was fine when you're 9, 10, 11 years old, but then when your body changes, when your hormones changes, when your environment changes, suddenly I was faced with the snake at the garden, the temptation that we all hit. And when we give a works-based answer to a life surrender question, we look at the holy word of God that says, what I care about is that you love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. And we say, all right, how about I just give you some semi-good behavior? And God's like, I don't care about behavior modification. I care about heart transformation. It's what I've always cared about. It's what's most important. Your behavior will modify as an overflow of your heart transforming. But too many of us are walking in legalism and missing relationship, a love that would compel obedience. And this was me, and so temptation hit. You start testing the waters. Going a little further, a little further. We all use the baseball metaphor and kind of starting to push the bases and struggling with porn in the darkness for 10 years of my life, desensitized, so turning to more and more perverse things. Started acting on that, acting those things out, thinking this was the picture of beauty and power. This is what men desired because many men's minds are being confused and that is what they find interesting. And studies show that then they can't even be stimulated by a real human being in front of them because they're so addicted to the immediate instant access gratification hit to the brain that the porn industry knows it owns us with. Went a little further and really in the throes of promiscuity. Oh, but I'm still a virgin. I haven't gone all the, all the, all the way. So that got to count for something. And then I'll never forget in college, I woke up after a night of partying. This was shortly pre-Jesus. I woke up completely hungover, trying to recall the events of the night before. Granted, I had, part of my testimony, I'd lost my dad to suicide just a year prior. So let me just caveat, adversity in our life and pain in our life is what will also catapult us into sexual sin if we're not armored up and ready because the holes in our heart are what we seek someone to fill. I remember waking up and trying to recall the night before and thinking through it and all of a sudden it struck me like a sword in the gut. I was an adulteress. I had hooked up with a married man in a drunken stupor, living like the world said is fine to live. Maybe he was separated. I'd heard small chatter. I could kind of remember. Was he divorced? Was he separated? Did it matter? I was an adulteress. How had I, the well-meaning church girl, fallen so far? I've got the scarlet A on my chest, and I'm like, what has happened? I know the scriptures. I know about God. I know what I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do. I'm still a virgin, right? Because we didn't really go all the way, but I'm an adulteress too. What is this? Hope at the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It was not long after that that I came to encounter Jesus. I was at a place of resentment, of pain, of depression, of anxiety, numb to promiscuity, a reputation a mile long behind me, and Jesus encountered my story and began to open my eyes to the truth about what he saw in me, what he desired from me, what he had the power to purify and transform in my heart. He began to open my eyes to the desire for heart transformation. He began to open my eyes to the call for purification. He began to open my eyes to my depravity And he met me with a word to say, I'm not finished with you yet. I love you. I see you. I know you. I have plans for you. I have pure purpose for you. I don't care if you have a scarlet letter and a list a mile long. The cross of Christ says it is finished and you are redeemed. And when I came to know Jesus, I began to look at the word and see sex differently. And what I encountered was who Jesus really is in light of our sexual sin. 
You see, right now, there's a lot of people in this room who are blushing or sweating profusely and sitting like this because you don't want anybody to know. And it's a lot and it's overwhelming. And has she read my junk mail? And how does she know about my browser history? And how do they know about last weekend? I don't know you, but I know what is not uncommon to mankind with our struggles. But I also know the living God who says, I have more for you. I have a call for you. I have plans and purpose for you, but I desire you be a pure vessel. The enemy will tell you, oh, no, 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 no. If the people around you knew, if your close friends knew, if your family knew, what would they think of you when we're silenced by shame? Oh, you don't have any room to speak into this area to... You're in ministry. You're running your campus ministry and you're in sexual sin. If they found out about that, what would that look like for you when the enemy is going to sell us a narrative of just ignore it rather than allowing God to do the hard but holy heart work in you? Oh, but God's not finished with you yet. I thought I knew who God was and it terrified me in light of my sexual sin, but then I came across the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Please tell me we know it. Y'all, I speak to some groups, and I'm like, we all know this from Scripture, and they're like, never read my Bible. I don't know. (laughs) But I've been coming to youth group for eight years. I'm like, what? (laughs) Okay. Point is, I came across... I have two minutes and I have so many things I want to say and so many funny stories. So I'll focus here. I came across the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And what I saw when I read this was that Jesus met this woman who by all accounts was a whore. He spoke to her. And Jesus has come sometimes sassy in scripture. If you really read and like get the vibes of his personality, I'm like, a little shady, but it's all right. (laughs) So he says, woman, go and get your husband. This woman's like, I have no husband. And he's like, I know. Well, I don't think he laughed, but he was just like, I know. I don't think he laughed. It's my flesh taking over. I would have giggled if I knew. But he's like, I know, you've had five. And the man you're married to now isn't even one of them. And what happens when Jesus encounters this person with this reputation that's owned her, with this sexual story, this narrative that has permeated her life with sin she has been enslaved to, what happens is that Jesus encounters her and the first thing he does is draw all of her sin up before her. Like, well, that's offensive. Well, yeah, Debbie, it's offensive because he wants to purify us. The gospel is offensive. He didn't die so we'd be comfortable. He died so we'd become godly and holy like him, that we would see a generation shift. Oh, he drums all of her filth up before her. What makes it remarkable, what must have shifted something in her heart is that in the face of her filth, he stayed. And he offered her living water that she would never thirst again. Can you guys imagine this woman has walked this same trail from town to the watering hole? And in fact, she's out there, I think, around noon. That's when nobody would have been out there. It's hot. She's avoiding people. She's walked this same tired trail, and some of us have too. I really love this, and this is good, and this is fine. This is wounding me, and so I need to walk back. I need to do better. I need to depend on you, God. I can do it. I can figure it out. Okay, I feel equipped, and we walk back into the world, and I know what I'm doing here, and then we see this person doing that or that, justifying this, or the media or the culture presenting a new slant here, and we're worn out, and we walk tired back here and try to fill up, and then we go to the world and want our affirmation from social media, from others to give it to us, and it leaves us thirsty, so we go back and we walk the same tired trail as the Samaritan woman. When will we stop at the well and listen to him say, I have living water. You would never thirst again. Do you know what I love about the Samaritan woman? Many of us would run off in shame Some of us want to run out of this auditorium right now. Many of us would run off and deny it and rationalize it, and that was one time, and I was drunk, and this, this, and that. It doesn't matter. What I love about the Samaritan woman is he drums up all of her filth in the face of her filth, her lack of sexual understanding, the pain, the confusion, whatever your past holds, 
he stays and he offers her living water. And that woman says, you must be the son of God. You told me everything about myself. And y'all, if you read the gospel, the whore at the well, the person with the sexual backstory, the baggage, is the first person that Jesus gives explicit permission to. I call you redeemed. Now go tell him who I am. Jesus had moved in ministry and meticulous about the release of his ministry. He'd been doing things Jesus does on a Tuesday. He's healing the lame. He's giving sight to the blind. But every time he's like, don't tell them what I've done. Don't tell them who I am. But the whore in the well, the millennial with the sexual backstory, he encounters, calls redeemed, and compels into evangelism. It's the first person he gives permission to and says, go tell them who I am. Tell them that I see you. Tell them that I know you. Tell them I love you. Tell them I knit you together. Tell them I write the reputation over your life and your banner says redeemed. So I don't care what your backstory says. I don't care what all the guys know about you. I don't care what your friend group is testing you in, men. I don't care if your browser history is riddled with pain and brokenness. Right now I encounter you and I say, take living water. Repent. Turn. Don't look back. Go tell them. And hundreds come to believe in response to this woman's faithfulness. Revival sparks in response to a sexually broken individual realizing that the enemy does not have permission or power to hold them in those strangleholds any longer, but the one who knit us together with our value, married together sexual instruction, guides us in obedience, use Rahab the prostitute in the lineage of the king of all kings, redeems the woman at the well, casts no stone to the adulteress, that God, that Jesus, that one who has much to say about sex, says, I see you. And I love you. I love you. I want us to be a generation where hashtag me too, or hashtag me too fades away and hashtag me first rises up. Create in me then a clean heart, oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Me first, let me work through this hard but holy heart work so that I can speak truth in life. Let me be fruitful because I know your power. I know your redemption. I trust your grace. Let me walk in purity. Let me build my life on purity. Let me look different than the world that is raging a different message so that when the hurting and the broken turn for some hope, some word of truth, we're not silent any longer, but we can say, I know about the sanctity of sex. Like the Lion of Judah, I will roar about restoring purity to the body of Christ, reaching those hurting and lost and speaking life and hope and truth and redemption. Crushed my time limit. I'm sorry. You guys are probably late for class. Just tell them it was me. Grace, tell your dad thank you. I also made you tardy for class, so a second apology to him. (laughs) But listen... (laughs) Don't let the enemy silence you with shame and let you feel like you are counted out. Repent. Turn. The difference in asking forgiveness and repenting. Asking forgiveness is wonderful and beautiful, but the definition of repenting is turning away from. Don't look back like Lot's wife and turn to a pillar of salt. There's nothing back there. But X's and messes and pain. No, turn and run. Run towards the cross of Christ that calls you redeemed and run towards the truth of God that has a lot to say about sex. Help reclaim sex for the glory of God and watch this generation shift. Dear Lord, we love you. Oh, we praise you. I thank you, God. Thank you for the work that you have done. Thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you for the work that you will do on this campus in these hearts. God, would we be a generation that doesn't blindly chase behavior modification and hope it somehow counts for something. No, would we be a generation that builds our life on heart transformation? Would we be a generation that doesn't ask how far is too far, but rather asks how close can I draw near? Would we be a generation awakened, activated, covered in the truth of our identity, our worth, our value in you, and the value of obedience to your design. You know what is best for us, God. We want to be used by you, 
but more than anything, we want to know you intimately. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. Soften hearts. It's your love and your kindness that lead to repentance, God. Draw us near to you. Jeremiah 33, 3, ask me and I will tell you remarkable things you do not know of what's to come. Oh God, there's hearts in here that are tired and weary and worn out where they are. Lord, would they be compelled to ask you, what if I turned, what would that look like for me? God, meet us. Reveal yourself to us. Forgive us. Light a fire in us that can't be put out, that we would be fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.